how to create your unit graphics from Blender to Godot. Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. So I currently made this nice soldier here and I want to put that inside Godot. How do you do it? So it's actually very simple and I'm going to be showing you some techniques to optimize that process. So how can you make that process as lightweight as possible? Because as you know, game engines need to be working in real time and when you are working with Blender, you usually work with renders and stuff which is a little different than game engines, so you need to optimize everything you can. And hopefully you can import and create your own units for your RTS or other projects you are working on. How can you optimize your unit's 3D mesh and animation? First thing, let's start with the obvious one that most people probably know about, triangle count. So this guy on the left here has 1200 triangles. This guy on the right here, on the other hand, has only 900 triangles. And both of them look absolutely similar. What's the secret? Well, from simplified geometry while still keeping silhouettes and animation topology. So sometimes you want to leave some edge loops around animation bits that are going to bend, stretch, etc. Those are important parts of the topology regarding for animation. Everything else you can simply merge together and create a bunch of triangle mess because it doesn't matter. And especially from the distance, even this model is considered high resolution. But I can reuse this model on other projects as well. So you can see here, I started with separate fingers, more details, more topology. And here I even go as far as to delete some meshes, some parts of the mesh. So you can see here under the fingers here, there's no faces on here. You can see that the fingers here are also merged together. Whereas on the original model that I finished, the fingers are completely separate. So these are techniques you do to simplify the triangle count, reducing overall cost of showing the on screen, and applying materials, etc. And here's something quite important in Godot, forward is minus Z. And that translating to Blender is pointing Y. So plus Y in Godot is minus Z. So this is very important and Godot actually provides a function, a argument for a function that allows you to flip things up. But if you want to get that straight out of the box, looking on the right direction, you should put your character facing Y coordinate forward. That is going to be translated as minus Z in Godot, which is forward inside the game engine. Also, another thing you have to keep in mind when you are working with 3D models is that giving them the smooth shading or the shading auto smooth, every single hard edges you're going to get here is going to be basically increasing your primitive count. So primitive count vertex does not show up here on Blender, but if you import inside Ido, you can see those right away. So that is also something to keep aware. You want a better performance for the model? Guess what? Keep them all shaded smooth. Really interesting stuff. And almost on that same page, every seam you put on your 3D mesh is also going to increase your vertex count. Basically, it's meaning that every time you see a split on the texture, on the UV editor is basically duplicating the vertex. So short answer for UV seams, the less you have, the better. And also you have to worry about the texture stretching and everything else regarding the 3D models. So keep that in mind when you are UV unwrapping your 3D mesh. Less seams are the better. Also something else we want to talk about is the number of bones you have on your animated model and actually something very specific, the number of deformable bones. So it doesn't matter if you have bones that are like bow bones, IK bones, and bones that help other bones to move like this guy here. This guy is not an NK controller, but rather a constraint helper for our damp track, so it can simulate the act of the head locking. So the bones that don't deform any parts of the mesh are actually negligible for performance. They are not deformable bones, and you can see here a checkbox for it to be deformable. So why you don't mark them deformable? Because when you export as a GOTF, you have a small option that says only export deformable bones which means we only want to export parts of the bones that deform the mesh itself. We don't want to export a bone that doesn't exactly deform the mesh directly, but rather just affects other bits of the animation. Those bones we do not want to export. And that concludes on something important as well. The less bones you have, the better for performance, because the less work there is on the GPU side to do the skinning process. 
So the less bones and the simple it is your bone structure, the faster it's going to be working on your game. So this is an RTS. So I basically excluded from the bones, the feet, the hands and fingers, and even the weapon. So this one is actually a little troublesome because when you are animating, you don't have precise control of where the gun is pointing. It's a little hackish. You have to position them on specific angles and use the pole here to get precise positions to aim the weapon, etc. So I might change that. But overall, you don't want to have a lot of bones to be exported for your game engine. Every single bone is going to increase your bone calculations. So if you can, keep the bone count as simple as possible. Also something to keep in mind is the influence of every vertex for bone. So if you don't know, I don't think, I don't remember is six or three. So each vertex on your model, there's a limit by the GLTF standard format. And I think it's also inside Gideo that limits. So you cannot have a single vertex to be influenced by more than three bones. I think that is the standard for the GLTF. I could be wrong, it could be six don't want a single vertex to be binded to more than three bones that is going to generate errors because the GLTF format is going to cap that. So if you see some weird skinning on your animations, make sure your vertex influences are not more than three bones. And there's actually a function inside Blender that allows, that allows you to do that. I think it's limits total and you can see here the limit the number of weights per vertex and that is can be applied to the, onto the form bones selected bones or all groups and you can set here the limit so this is something for you to keep in mind this is not only going to be look very weird because this completely smooths off the skin and brings a lot of problems so check out your weight painting if you have any issues with that Another optimization you can do that is regarding on the material side. So you can see that the model where I started from, the materials are actually a lot high res for, for what they are needed to be. Because what is the actual use for this asset? This asset is going to be used inside an RTS as a unit. So it's going to be seen very far, almost like this. And you're not exactly going to see all the details you have here on the right texture, on the right resolution texture. And you can see from the distance, it almost looks the same. So both of these guys look the same, while one is a lot higher resolution. I think this guy is using a 124 by 124 texture, and this one is using a 256 by 256. And that is awesome because the lower the resolution size, and the lower the viewer and cost, and the faster your materials are going to be computed for your game. So there goes another tip, have low resolution materials if your assets are going to be far from the camera. And then it also can be applied to the mesh to polish thing. That was regarding optimization, which you need to provide a 3D model inside a game engine. You cannot export super high resolution meshes, it's not going to work, it's going to be a lot slower and you're going to sort of problems. So now let's talk about how you can copy the animations you made in Blender to Godot. How do you export them? Well, you have to pack them together. So let's go to the animation tab here. And this is a work in progress. So it's bare bones at the moment. So I just made two animations here, an idle animation and a walk animation. And let me just put here 90 frames and let's see what the animation is all about. So you can see very simple animation, very simple skeleton, etc. So we have one animation here for the guy walking and one animation that's basically a pose just for the guy being idling. So this is just enough for us to test it. So how do you pass those animations to be bundled inside the armature itself? Well, that then comes the NLA editor. And if you never use it, it's quite powerful, the NLA. So the way you do this is you select your armature that you want to store the animations. Then you're going to go to the action selection and you're going to select some animation. Then what you want is to stash that animation inside the NLA. So these two blocks here belong to the armature, a 3S basic soldier armature, and they will be exported together with the armature itself. And inside Godot, those are going to be displayed as animations inside an animation player. So the way you can build on them on here is you can stash them. This is going to create a new action stash and it's going to stash the animation you give there. But I like to use this lower button here because it actually names it appropriately. So it's just speed things up. And that's going to reset your action and you don't need to use that anymore. Now, 
that by itself will allow you to import a lot of animations inside a single armature. There are also something you have to keep aware of. There are some import flags that you can type here that is going to determine the behavior when you import this animation inside Gideo. For example, as you guessed, typing dash loop here will allow Gideo to automatically mark that animation as a looping animation. So that is also something you have to keep in mind. There are certain keywords that you can type to influence how the animation is handled inside Gideo. So that is basically everything you have to set up just to make your mesh inside Gideo. The next step will be for you to actually export it. So you're going to export as a GLTF. So let's see here the options that you can use to export your GLTF inside Gideo. So I like to use the GLB format. It's the smallest and it's the fastest one. You can also use the GLTF with the separate bean and textures, etc. So we want to include selected objects, which is our amateur and object. And actually you can select your way to export the animations and the armature. You need to select both of them. Well, let me just go back here to the export tab. And now we have the armature and the mesh selected. So we want to include then the limits only to selected objects. So we want to export the mesh, apply modifiers, keep UVs and export the normals. Materials, I don't want to export any materials that are here inside Blender. I want to make my own inside Godot. It's just a single image. It's a very simple shader. It doesn't need to export from, from Blender. And the material that is exported from Blender is only in the PBR principal shader. If you made all the materials here, I don't know if that's going to be exported all well. And there's a workflow you can search on the internet for that, to export PBR materials from Blender to Godot. That's another thing. So we do not want shape keys. The armature itself, we want to use the rest position and we want to export only deformation bones. This is going to reduce the number of bones in your skeleton to that property I talked about, where in your armature you can define if a bone is actually deforming in the mesh or is just there to help the animation, to help constraints like the IK pointers, etc. So armature is there. Then we also want to check this, which is going to export the skinny and then it's going to allow Godot to generate the skeleton and to bind the mesh back to the skeleton, use the skinny process. If export without this, it's not going to work. Lighting, let's leave it the standard. We do not want any compression. Animation, we want to export all the animations. And you can see here, it's going to export active actions and NLA tracks as GLTF animations. And then in Godot, it's going to be inside an animation player. You will also want the animation mode to be actions. So this is going to separate the actions as different animations and also NLA tracks, which is the, I think it's the default one. Estimate ranges. So here I only have checked the negative frames to be cropped. So if your animation has keyframes below the frame zero, it's going to be cropped. You can also use slides to just slide the animation back to start the frame zero. So negative frames are exported. I don't want that. The amateur want to reset pose bones between actions, shape key animations we don't use, and sample animations. So this is a very important one. So in Blender, we can have a lot of dynamic actions between the bones. You can have constraints, IKs, drivers, a lot of magic things that is going to make the animation work a lot better, a lot more interesting, a lot of automatic functions. Those types of dynamic objects cannot be exported to Godot. They don't have the same things and Blender is actually used to be rendered to export animations. When you are working with game engines, you need the everything to happen in, in real time. So you need IKs in real time, you need constraints in real time and most of the time game engines don't have that. So the way you can export animations that have dynamic properties such as constraints, RKs, or drivers, you can do that with sample animations. So this is going to actually rebake all your animations and export that instead. Instead of your keyframes, for example, if you made an animation walk cycle with just four keyframes or five, it's going to export a lot, bunch of them, like 19, 20 keyframes. And that is because it's actually sampled the animation. So this, depending on the type of thing you are doing, most likely you want to sample animations. If you really know what you're doing, you can work without sample animations, but from my experience, just leave at the default. 
Blender is going to bake all your animations together and doesn't matter which constraint you have, everything you see on the animation is going to be inside Gideon. So this should be the default way you leave it. And you can also adjust the sample rate. So how often you want to bake the animations. You can bake by each frame, by each two frames, three frames, etc. So depending on the things you are doing, you can change the sample rate to get a specific style where you want to optimize animations. So this is also something to keep in mind. We also want to optimize our animations by the GLTF format, so we can optimize our animation size and keep channels for bones. So if you had animations for objects, the GLTF can, will not export that. And this is the default options. I actually don't know what is possible by animating channels for objects. I think that is something new. So regarding the export process, that is everything you have to do. And after you export all of this, you should be able to open inside Gideo and have your 3D asset, in this case, this basic soldier, to be ready to roll inside your project. Simple as that. You just make the mesh, paint the bones, paint the UV skinny process, do some animations, glue them together inside the NLA editor, group them all together, can apply some keywords here to set some types of import process flags for Gideo, and you are basically ready to roll. So that is everything you have to do to just import your 3D mesh from Blender to Gideo. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you on the next one.